Hello, everybody. This is uh, Jacob Saposhnik, the host of the Enchanting Lawyer podcast, and welcome to our show. And um, uh, every week, we try to uh, gather um, uh, creative, innovative um, people in the legal space and, uh, and also entrepreneurs who are not lawyers to share their ideas with us and help us just do our, our job better. And um, uh, today, I have um, um, uh, an interesting company and, uh, and the founder of a company called Lowlytics. The company was actually started by an attorney and a software engineer, and uh, their premise is to empower lawyers to have better websites, make better marketing choices, and get a better value from their marketing. Uh, they believe that every law firm should own and control their own websites and the content, and they also build systems to allow them to do it easily. And um, I am excited to have um, uh, the founder of the company, Dan Jaffe, join us here from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. How are you, Dan? I'm good, Jacob. How are actually, you doing? Yeah, actually, you're in Tucson, not in Phoenix, right? Uh, yeah, we're in Tucson. Yeah, right. perfect. Um, I'm doing pretty good. I am excited to uh, to have you on the show. And uh, why don't you tell? Uh, you know, most of our listeners are attorneys and uh, other professionals, and you are an attorney yourself. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your you know your journey from an attorney to somebody who is in the in the tech space? Uh, I'm I'm personally curious to to um, to learn about you know your transition and and what you do at Lowlytics. Sure. Yeah. And thank you for having me on. Um, yeah. So I, I graduated from law school in 98 and uh, started my first uh, solo practice in Seattle uh, in 99. Mm-hmm. And uh, at that time, the internet was just coming uh, on board as a viable way of, of communicating. And um, I was sitting there in my office doing work for other lawyers, uh, just barely scraping by, trying to survive, waiting for the phone to ring, and decided to teach myself how to build a website. Mm -hmm. Uh, Built it and uh, was one of the first lawyers to have a uh, website in the Seattle area trying to attract clients. And my practice just immediately took off once the website was launched and and started gaining traction. was there for a few years practicing and ended up then moving down to Phoenix uh, for a number of different reasons, including my wife is from Arizona, mm-hmm. and, uh, and did it again uh, there in Arizona. Uh, practiced in Arizona and really until uh, 2009. And, and during that time, um, I was constantly getting questions asked of me by, by other attorneys, both in uh, the Phoenix area and in other jurisdictions, you know, how, how are you doing this? How are you attracting uh, clients online? And um, around uh, 2008, a friend of mine from Seattle was trying to grow his practice, which happened to be a, a DUI and criminal defense practice, mm-hmm. which was uh, the area that I was focusing on as well. And um, I had this domain name, duiattorney.com, that I had purchased uh, early on in, in my career. And I, I decided, well, I could see if I could try to help him get some business by developing it into more of kind of like a joint tenancy uh, type uh, website. Yeah. And, uh, and, and did that. And it ended up taking off so quickly as a directory where um, attorneys – uh, basically uh, occupied uh, exclusive areas with, within their state or, or, or counties, uh, that within a year I had to make the decision, do I do that full-time or do I practice law full-time because there was no time sure. uh, to do both well. And so having, having started uh, two successful law practices, I was kind of bitten by the tech bug and um, – and basically saw that through, started getting acquisition offers from, from big companies uh, shortly into it, really taking off, uh, ran it for about uh, two years and finally got it, got an offer that I thought was in the best interest of both our uh, attorney customers and, and the company and my family as a whole. Uh, and that acquisition offer was uh, what was going to seed Lawlytics, which is an idea that I had had for uh, many years and wanted to build. And, and so that's that's what led me to start Lawlytics. And so um, there, there's something that you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, describing your when you build your practice. What do you think was the uh, the main difference in the way you were um, uh, running your website? Um, and generating leads back in the day 
that was so popular and so attractive for you to be able to get those clients? Well, back then, I, I, I think it may have just been a, a numbers game. So if you're, if you're the first actor in any market um, and there's not a whole lot of competition, then um, you, know, you have a severe advantage. Uh, at that time, you know, there, there was this internet boom going on in the Seattle area. Uh, there's Microsoft there. Mm-hmm. There's Amazon there. There were a bunch of other startups as well, with all these tech savvy young people who were uh, getting arrested for you know for various sure. things, mostly DUIs. And uh, you know they did not want to open the phone book. They wanted to look online, and it was me and and you know essentially one or two other attorneys there. And so I, I got to have a lot more conversations than you know a young lawyer in his mid twenties uh, would typically have based on that. Um, and then, you know, I, I always, I, I saw that that worked and I've, I've always been a student of, of, um, of what works online and, and, um, you know, trying to, to see a couple steps ahead whenever possible. And, you know, back then pay-per-click came on and, and at that point, you know, to get, uh, a case using pay-per-click, the acquisition cost was roughly 15 or 20 cents, uh, because nobody was doing sure. it and each click was a penny or two. And so, you know, and as, as each of these spaces got crowded, they became, you know, less, less cost effective, if not less viable. But it's, it's always, for me, it's always been kind of discovering that, uh, you know, that next thing. And, and I think it's so important what you just said, you know, being first in anything that we do, especially in the legal space, because, you know, everybody back in the day were in the yellow pages. How can you, how can you uh, penetrate that? It's impossible. And so you said, you know, being first, uh, I can I kind of compare it to what I've done in the in the social media space, where we're the first to to use Facebook as a predominant tool to uh, um, to reach out to our clients and build the platform, which was again today it will be very difficult to um, to do what I've done uh, you know five years ago, but again you know being first and finding out what is the next thing is really crucial, especially in our industry because everybody's copying each other and they want just you know I'll just I'll just do the same website, I'll just do the same blog. And it's very difficult to do that. And, and again, that area of the UI is so competitive. Um, and I think that uh, I, I mean, th- these are great um, um, insights as to what you've done. So tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Lowlytics. Like, why did you start? Why did you decide to do um, another company that will do websites for attorneys? I mean, there's so many of them out there. What is different about Lowlytics? Yeah. So when I was when I was practicing early on, um, actually when I first started my practice in the Phoenix area, so it was about you know four years into to practicing yeah. or so, um, and got very busy and got to the point where the internet was becoming more and more competitive, and decided to uh, try to delegate uh, some of some of the work on my website. Uh, Ended up delegating it to a company that had a great sales pitch and ended up almost completely ruining my website if I hadn't caught what they had done, which was a bunch of, of really nefarious practices uh, at the time that I did catch them and, and, and stayed up all night and changed it. Um, I, my website would have gone down and gotten banned along with all of their other other customers. And it, you know, at that point, it, re- it made me realize that, that one, as an attorney – there's not enough hours in the day to become a tech expert and a marketing expert and an expert in all these other things that, that you really need to be able to uh, keep up a, a comprehensive web presence. And so, uh, you know, what I wanted, I had this, this vision of, of what would the ideal technology do to empower me to be able to um, market my practice, participate in it as much as I wanted to, uh, without really having to worry about how it's how it's happening behind the scenes. Uh, and the technology there didn't exist uh, it, at the time. There was there's right. all these companies that provide uh, various legal marketing um, offerings. Most of them uh, don't have their own technology, and I saw I saw some severe advantages uh, both to the customers and from a business model in the long term of of building our own technology, and so that's what we did. And so essentially, um, if I'm an attorney and I want to um, uh, use uh, Lawlytics, what 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 is it? What would I get? So you you build a website and also give me the power to um, control. Uh, well, it- 
Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, typically speaking, if, if you're an attorney that signs up, either you have a website or you don't, most attorneys have a website of, of, of some sort at this point. And a lot of attorneys are not happy with the way that their website is going, or they just, they just want to be able to do more, or they have to, to email their web guy to make changes or, or, or whatever the case may be. And, and so the first thing we do is either build them a website using our platform, uh, or, uh, build the website using our platform and import their existing website. And, and once we do that, we have a sandbox where we can uh, show them what their website's going to look like, how it's going, to, how they're going to uh, control it, and so forth before it's ever launched. And then we give them training and strategy on on how to use it. And so it's you know not only do we teach them how to blog, but how to. Um, configure their content so that it uh, it conforms to best practices um, using Google Webmasters guidelines, and also talk about site architecture. How um, how if they're going to build a site that has five hundred or a thousand pages, right. how they might want to plan that out and organize it if they're going to do it themselves. Because you know a lot of a lot of attorneys come in. Uh, with a lot of enthusiasm, they want to build this empire, and then without the right guidance uh, right up front, uh, you know they they can quickly paint themselves into a corner and and cause a lot more work, and it can be discouraging. And so uh, we we're not only providing the the technology, but we're providing kind of the roadmap and the guidance to get to where they want to go. Now now some attorneys don't want to go there; they just want to have something that's uh, mobile compatible, responsive, looks great when they get referrals, so that there's a soft place to land. Uh, and and we certainly provide that as well. But really, the the, the power of Lawlytics is is in the technology combined with the collaboration uh, with us. Right. And so, um, um, you know, I, one of the things that, that's interesting and I wanted to, um, um, you know, it was good that you came on the show, is that I, I speak to a lot of attorneys and law firms and it looks like many of them are in the process of rebuilding or re- redesigning their websites these days. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure you see that as well. What, what do you think is that? Uh, like why now, why so many uh, uh, law firms are uh, eager to change their websites and, um, and, and redesign them? Well, I mean, from, from the conversations that we have with attorneys, it's it's not that they just are like changing their mind about the fashion of their website. It's just their their website as it is or was has stopped working. I mean, most attorneys, if if it's working, it's producing. They don't necessarily want to change things just to change them. And so, you know, they they've been either with a company for a long time, and that company has. You know, maybe painted them into a corner using using black hat tactics uh, from that used to work, but are are, are no longer viable. Um, or they did it themselves, and they've taken it as far as they can go themselves. And and you know, maybe their website is is not mobile compatible, or maybe it's even responsive, but it wasn't designed with a mobile first approach. Right. Uh, and they're realizing that that you know their their uh, client base is now largely mobile. Um, there, there's all kinds of, of reasons, but I think it all boils down to the same thing in that it's, they realize how important the internet is and how ineffective what they currently have, uh, has been for them. Right. And, and I, and I also think, um, you know, the, you know, again, like you said, having a, a website that's not working for you is definitely a reason for somebody to start thinking, well, I got better, better change something. But I also see, you know, the economy is definitely doing better. Attorneys are making more money. And and I feel that they feel that they understand the value of marketing more than the, than before. So before lawyers thought marketing was just you know you do it when when needed, but now they know that they have to do it on an ongoing basis. It's not like when business is not uh, uh, you know you don't have business coming from the door, you have to start marketing. No, you have to do it on a regular basis. And the first thing is a website. Uh, and and I always tell people that uh, if you don't have a good website that tells a story or or or, or educates. Um, your customers for the sake of educating them, not for selling, then it's, you're not doing a good job. So, um, you know, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the things that you see right now, uh, some of the new trends in, um, in website design, website, you know, just in, in some things that we need to know as lawyers uh, as we plan our, our, our redesign or, or, or upgrade of a website? What are the, some of the things that in 2015, as we almost come to the end of the year, we should be aware of? Well, I, I, I think 
the first and, and, and biggest thing on everybody's mind is, is how does it perform in a, a mobile touch enabled environment? Uh, can people contact you by touching the phone mm-hmm. number on, on the phone? Can they use the gestures that they're, they're, uh, you know, comfortable navigating with? Uh, and, and does the experience transition well from a mobile uh, to a desktop or laptop environment and, and, and back and forth because uh, the content is going to get consumed on so many different um, screen sizes and, and, um, and devices? And um, it's, it's not enough to, to just make it mobile compatible anymore. That's become a buzzword and there's, right. you know, it's a very low standard. Uh, it, it really has to be designed for mobile first. And, and when you do that, because it's the smaller uh, screen size, then you, you get a, um, a good experience on all screen sizes because it's a lot easier to design something that's beautiful and functional for a desktop than sure. it is um, for a screen uh, or for, for a, a cell phone uh, size screen. Um, you know, so so there's a lot of that, and then I, I think there's a, there's always a lot of distractions that people um, get focused on, uh, which I, I think are important to um, potentially ignore. A lot of a lot of trends, a lot of plugins, a lot of a lot of bells and whistles that people come to us and they say, you know, I, I think I need all these things, all these you know fifty plugins right. that do live chat, that do you know live video, that do all all these things, but. We try to focus them on uh, the environment that the the um, potential clients are going to consume the content in, and the content itself first, because that's really the foundation that everything else is built on. Uh, technology trends come and go. So, if you're looking, if you're talking about technology right now, uh, can you uh, point to a specific platform or technology that? You think lawyers should be uh, embracing right now their websites? That is something new that came out in the past year or so. Uh, as, as far as anything that came out in the past year or so, I don't really think that much has has changed. We've we've tried to design Lawlytics to be comprehensive, mm-hmm. and you know we 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 are not a WordPress platform. I know that's that's what a lot of attorneys are, are focused on right, right now. We we are um, proprietary, and and there's there's a lot of of WordPress plugins that come out, uh, come and go, and become um, become kind of trendy amongst attorneys, uh, and you know we we hear these different things uh, recommended, and and attorneys ask if if they can use these. Most of the stuff, you know, we can we already have uh, native in Lawlytics that we've determined that is is useful for attorneys to have, um, but you know in in terms of outside things that that we don't do that I am starting to see a, a, a greater need for that that if you would have asked me a couple of years ago uh, whether I think this is a good idea or not is uh, more of the marketing automation uh, end of it um, several years ago I was of the opinion that if you're an attorney and you know especially if you're in something that's right. sensitive like criminal defense or um, bankruptcy uh, or divorce uh, you you don't necessarily want to have a drip email uh, sequence coming to you just because you visited a lawyer's website uh, and requested information but uh, you know now now we are starting to recommend uh, that in certain areas of practice, when when done tastefully and strategically, that lawyers uh, do start to embrace marketing automation uh, because it, it it allows them to uh, keep in contact with and 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 exert influence sure. on those that are re- researching, even though they may not necessarily be ready to um, engage an attorney. Right, and, and I think the follow up process and the communication of automation is important because. Most, most people complain they don't get follow-up from their attorneys. So they may send them an email with an inquiry and they never get a response back. And I think with a proper automation, it, it can happen that you get uh, several emails and eventually uh, the client would like to engage with you uh, because they feel that there is a consistent follow-up from the firm side. So uh, absolutely, automation is key. What, do you, what is your opinion on, on blogging? Because you know, blogging uh, was huge uh, several years ago. And then recently, um, uh, people don't see so much value in blogging. And, and, and also, talking about blogging, um, blogs that are part of the website or separate from the site. So I'll, I'll be curious to know uh, your opinion on that as well. 
I, 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 and I see the two questions as absolutely related. Um, first of all, I, I don't agree at all that the blogging is, um, is in any way diminished from where it was. I think the blogging is every bit as powerful as it ever was. I think that there are marketing forces out there that are trying to convince attorneys to spend money on disposable advertising, pay-per-click marketing, remarketing, uh, these things that, that one, don't require any effort or thought from attorneys, uh, and, and two, lie in the marketer's pockets uh, better. I think the ones that, that are, are being honest about it uh, that are, are really encouraging attorneys to do what's in their best interest are still very much encouraging attorneys uh, to blog because the fact is it works like nothing else works. Um, and, and, and when you're talking about having either a, a website or a blog um, or the two of those combined, uh, you know, back in 2003, 2004, uh, it was really difficult to have the two of those things together. It, mm-hmm. it, it's you know the best you'd have to have a, a blog on a, a subdomain because the technology wasn't there. Blog's definition was was basically um, a journal online that you can update right. uh, periodically, uh, and, and the website was more the static content. Uh, I I believe that in most cases, and there certainly are some exceptions, that the website and the blog. Um, should be combined. I, I think that it's it's a bogus argument at this point in, in the internet's evolution to argue that uh, the website is advertising, the blog is is just conversation. Uh, the fact is is that pretty much every attorney that's out there is not blogging for their health. They're blogging because they're trying to build readership. They're trying to build influence, and ultimately, the goal is to get. Uh, uh, new clients, uh, whether sure. it's through referrals or reaching them directly, and so um, I, I think it's more efficient to have uh, have the two of those combined if it's done in, in a tasteful way. And and it's it's natural if if a potential client or referral source is um, is reading a blog and and they like what the attorney has to say uh, to want to find out about that attorney and the services they offer and 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 so forth and to disrupt them and have to take them to another property I don't I don't think is is the right tactic in uh, in 2015 and beyond right and we talked about this earlier before we started the podcast that there's been a lot of changes in SEO uh, strategies and just uh, the way content is being uh, 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 created so why don't you talk a little bit about that uh, you know what are the, some of the new uh, ways content is uh, should be created I mean before, the notion was that we have to use heavy keywords. We have to, uh, you know, place those keywords everywhere. We have to write articles for SEO, and 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 right now, it feels like it's it's more for uh, for the content itself. And so, when we talk about that, some of these changes, and what does it mean for lawyers? Yeah. Well, if you look at Google's intention historically, it's it's always, and I say Google because it's the dominant search engine. Right. But you know, you could substitute any of the other search engines as well. You know, the, their business is largely based on giving uh, their customers, their searchers, the uh, the best, most relevant results. And uh, all of the keyword stuffing that used to go on was very much designed to trick Google. Google has gotten a heck of a lot smarter than any of the internet marketers that might cold call a lawyer's office at this point, and uh, you know, to sell stuff like keywords and and. Um, unearned backlinks and so forth. And I, I think that most of that stuff is completely useless, if not um, counterproductive at this point. The, the way that I like to describe it to our clients uh, is when you go to create content for your website, uh, if you really sit down and think about when you're sitting across your desk or your conference table from a potential client, what questions do they have of you? Uh, how do they ask those questions? What words do they use? Um, where, where are their major concerns? And if you write your website, and whether it's a website or a blog, I'm just talking about all the material that you put online in a place that, that you own and control, so on your domain. Um, as, as you add that information, if you're answering their questions uh, the way that they would ask 
them, uh, it's not only going to do well with the search engines, uh, it's going to also convert those people uh, into fans, uh, followers, and, and potential customers or clients right. if, if, if they need it later on. So it's you know, really just, you know, Google is just basically a, a one big uh, question board where people go to ask questions that they want answers for. And uh, we, we've, as attorneys, we have to give them the answers. Uh, if, if we just give them a, a page that's stuffed with keywords or is written in, in poor English uh, or whatever the, the searcher's native language happens to be, uh, you know, it might get them there if the trick works for a while, but it's still not going to convert them well. And I, and I totally agree with that, that you know, answering questions, uh, you know, write down questions that clients ask and, and craft content around that is definitely going to be the way to go um, in the future, and that's what the search engine wants to see. And, and again, it's, it's, it's actually good practice because not only it helps you rank high, but also people who come to your website, they can feel that you generally know what you're doing and they want well, to work it, with you, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it also there's also an ancillary benefit that uh, once the person becomes a client, if you've done enough to educate them on your website and blog, uh, one, it's going to take less of your time answering their questions. And unless you're charging by the hour, right. uh, that is probably a good thing. And it also is a great place to um, set expectations and, and, uh, and do some you know, pre-retention client expectation management, which can also go a long ways. And, and it gets them participating more and, and, and more... Uh, involved in their case without you having to spend any additional time. Exactly. Absolutely. So hopefully that's uh, something that people can take away from this because, again, content and how to create it and what to write is always a big question people want to know. So, uh, Dan, as we come to the end of our show, I wanted to uh, perhaps ask you this question. Maybe you can uh, share this with, uh, with our listeners. So if, if, if I would ask you what would be the, the best way to, for a firm or a solo to craft their website strategy, what would be kind of like a, like a mini roadmap that you will um, tell somebody to, uh, to follow? Well, one, I don't think that there are any shortcuts. And so like it's, it's re- for me, it's really difficult to encapsulate it in, in you know, a couple minutes of, of talking about it. Uh, but I, I think it really boils down to uh, you as the attorney know everything about your practice area in your head better than anybody else knows it. You also care about your practice more than right. anybody is going to care about your practice for you. And so the, the, the single most effective thing that you can do, even if you don't do any of the work on your website or your marketing uh, yourself, is to not abdicate that responsibility entirely. Because if, if you don't spend time thinking about what you want and how to get it and learning about how this stuff works, there are so many predatory marketing companies out there uh, that their sales pitches are going to sound better to you than the things that really work because um, th- there's a lot of stuff that sounds once you once you understand how this stuff works that it is too good to be true, uh, and, and so the best thing that you can do is 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 protect yourself by becoming uh, involved, and then you know really it's just a matter of of focusing in on who you want to communicate with. Um, I, I see that you've done. A really, a really good job of really focusing your practice on on a niche area, and I'm assuming that right. uh, that has served you really well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, um, you know I've decided early on that one practice area would be the way to go, just because mm-hmm. you can focus the content, you can get more authority, and um, uh, and just be able to uh, position yourself as an expert. So that's one way to do it. But I feel, but, but I, I agree that um, you know. Trying to understand who is the audience, who are the people that you want to attract to the website is always something that I, 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 I ask myself every time because and that's how we tweak our content because it's you know, we're not serving everybody. It's for particular, even within immigration, our client is defined as uh, uh, you know, uh, an immigrant who came here uh, to the purpose to start a business. And so you know, just, just an idea of, uh, you know, if you're a criminal attorney, uh, you know, your profit will be uh, that client. And then you want to write for that pe- person and, and build all your branding for that, for that avatar who is your client. And I, and I think that will be helpful to work for, uh, for somebody like you who works with clients and also for us when we come to work with, uh, with a web developer that we know who we are trying to sell and who we're serving. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Who, who do you want to influence? And, um, you know, attorneys tend to use big words. And, uh, you know, when we're talking, especially amongst ourselves, we tend to forget that a lot of people that haven't gone through law school or even practiced law uh, don't understand those words. And so, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of, of, of really considering your audience, like you said. Exactly. So then I wanted to thank you for uh, uh, coming on the show. Why don't you tell us uh, where the listeners can find your website uh, and maybe you connect with you if you have a, an email or a Twitter account. Great, yeah. So, yeah, and thank you for, for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. Um, the company is Lawlytics, L-A-W-L-Y-T-I-C-S. Uh, we're at www.lawlytics, L-A-W-L-Y-T-I-C-S.com. Um, our, our phone number is 800-713-0161. And uh, if, if anybody's heard this podcast and wants to speak directly with me, uh, they can email me directly at dan at lawlytics.com or call our, our main number, and I'm happy to chat. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dan, for taking the time and coming on the show. And uh, thank you to our listeners who listen every week, send your emails, comments, and help us um, uh, improve our show and get uh, great speakers and the guests to come on and share the wisdom. And uh, from sunny San Diego, I'm saying goodbye, and we'll see you next time in our next episode.